Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. I'm your host, Marcus Engel, and this is the podcast that teaches compassionate communication, provides perspective, and inspires resilience. And today I'm super excited to bring Ted Meyer to the Compassion and Courage audience. Ted and I recently got to work on an initiative together, and I'm so excited to be able to share you with the Compassion and Courage audience. Ted, thanks for being with me today. I am glad to be here. Well, excellent. So I, I feel like whatever we talk about the, the things that this podcast focus on, which is compassionate communication, uh, providing perspective and inspiring resilience, we're going to cover all three of those with your work today. Okay. Uh, Ted, let me let me just share a little bit about you if I can and, and feel free to fill in all of the all of the areas that I miss. But um, okay. friends who are listening, Ted is a nationally known artist and academic. He uh, is the artist in residence at USC Keck School of Medicine, correct? Correct. This is something that I am really excited to talk to you about. You're uh, also an artist on your own in your work. This this is a cool subject. So much of your, your work uh, subject, and I'm not even sure what the right terms are to use since I am not a visual artist of any kind, uh, but your subject matter are people like me, people who have been changed and had their physical bodies changed by trauma or chronic illness or disease. So I guess, I guess, where should we start? Where should we start here? Because you have a story yourself. You have a great work uh, and and mission. So where where would you like to start this conversation today? Well, Tom? I guess I, so. I have a genetic illness. So I was born with a pretty rare genetic illness called Gaucher's disease. Uh, a lot of Eastern Europeans have it. Uh, well, not a lot because it's rare. A number of Eastern Europeans have it, and people came over here. Although it's found around the world, but it's a it, it's in the blood. I'm, I'm missing an enzyme. I don't produce an enzyme, and that caused a lot of trouble for me. I spent a lot of my childhood in and out of hospitals and a lot of time missing school. I was the original homeschooler before people decided to homeschool because they were afraid of what their kids would learn. And uh, so for the first couple decades of my life, I was told you're not going to live very long, and that that was sort of it. And then they came up with a treatment. When I was five years old, I gave bone marrow to NIH uh, to work on research for this disease. And when I was 42, I finally got the, the treatment. So it's not a cure, but I made it long enough to be stabilized. So when I was younger, sort of a long answer. When I was younger, I did work about my illness because as you know, and I'm sure a lot of the people listening, if they're in similar circumstances, you think about what's going on with you a lot. So I did artwork about that. And then when this new treatment came along, I started doing work about other people. And that's when I started doing work about people like you, people with scars from a myriad of different things, whether it's cancer or being in Iraq or being in a car accident or needing a heart transplant. So there was this natural transition to sort of being not self-centered, but self-focused when I was sick to once I wasn't deciding I was going to do this same work, but about other people and tell their stories. So you said that this is a, a disease that causes, uh, that, that has something to do with a lack of an enzyme. How does that manifest in your body when you're a kid? Well, I, this, I, this is my first time hearing of this disease. I, I assume yeah, it's, it's pretty uh, rare. awfully rare. Yeah. Um, well, you, Lipid cells uh, land up getting impacted in the long bones. So the the first things people notice, you get an enlarged spleen because 
that gets sick. And then when you take the spleen out, uh, well, nowadays they don't take out the spleen, but when I was a kid they did. And then all those things happen in the long bones. So your bones, you get bone infarctions, your bones deteriorate, it's really painful. And when I was a kid, I would be in the hospital three or four times a year for several weeks. And all they could really do back then was just give me really strong painkillers and put me to sleep until it passed. So I would be in the hospital and I'd be, like, literally I could be fine in the morning riding a bicycle and in the hospital that evening because it would come on that that quick. I just never knew. I, knew, I had no idea. I couldn't plan. Even as a kid, whatever plans kids have, I couldn't do it, you know. And and it would it would just come over you just that quickly. It, it was any specific part of the body or everywhere. Well, mostly my hips, my hips, and okay. and the joints. Um, because what what happens is you get a bone infarction, which is when the blood flow doesn't get to the ends of the bones. It happens sometimes for athletes when they get bad uh, bruising, and then if you can't get blood to the tips of the bones, as soon as you put weight on them, they collapse. <laughs> So that happened to me a lot. And I had a very large spleen, which was removed when I was five or six years old. Nowadays, though, because of the medicine, kids don't... It's an, it's, I was just at a meeting yesterday for people with this illness. And nowadays, the kids, they don't... The kids, the kids are lucky. They don't have to have their spleens removed. Or if they start on medicine early enough, they don't have any of these symptoms. It's... You know, I won't say a miracle drug because it's not a miracle. It's all years and years and years of science by researchers working in their cubicles. Um, but bless them. Bless them all. <laughs> yes. It, 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 is this a, an infusion? Is this immunotherapy or For what type of the first medicine? 20 years I took medicine uh, from when I was 42 until I was about 60. I took an infusion once every two weeks, it took about two hours. And about four years ago, I started, or three years ago, I started on a pill. I take a pill every morning and it works differently. And honestly, I do not even understand how oh. it works, but it does, it works completely differently than giving you the enzyme, but it keeps me, it keeps me whole. Wow, and, and I, I often say uh, that that you can kind of throw a lot of Maslow's pyramid of hierarchical needs out the window when one is in severe pain. You're not yeah. worried about self-actualization when you are in absolute uh, awful pain. And and so you going through this, I, I've... I empathize with you quite a bit um, as much as I can know what what your specific pain felt like. Uh, what how, as an artist, you you would transform that pain into something of beauty. How, how did that process get started and, and how did you how did you do that? You know, I just I. When I was a kid, like every other, other little kid, I would draw cars and baseball players and, and things like that. But I was in the hospital so much, and there was a, a volunteer. And this was, this was like 50 years ago, so it was before art therapy was a, a big deal. And this volunteer came into my room and just said, how are you doing? And I was like, I hate it here. And she says, well, you know, you can draw about the fact that you hate it here. And it was just this person giving me the freedom to be angry as a little kid. Because, you know, as a little kid, you're supposed to suck it up. And you're supposed to not make people uncomfortable with how miserable you are. Because, you know, no matter how compassionate adults are, they don't like to see sick kids. And this woman gave me the freedom to say, I don't like my situation and express it. And she said, express it with crayons and pencils and stick an IV tube or a bandage on the drawing if, you wanted, if I wanted to talk about what it was like being in the hospital. 
So that really started me going with the idea that I could, I could visualize my emotions through art to explain it to other people. It, it's one of two times in my life where everything changed because somebody said something to me that made sense, you know. And what made sense to you was to be able to express. Yeah, it's it's. Uh, so, so when did you when did you start picking up cameras and documenting the the lives of people whose lives had been changed? Well, that happened. So that was the second time where somebody said something to me. So I was I was in a, a art opening. I was in Beverly Hills. And I was showing a bunch of artwork that was pretty generic. It was it was decorative, but it wasn't particularly good. And it was interesting because I I felt something was missing from my artwork. From this was right around the time when I started getting healthy. And when I did the artwork about being sick, people might not have bought it, but they but they had an emotional impact from it. And I was doing pretty work. It was cute. There were some cats in it. The, you know, I mean, every, everybody liked it, but it wasn't selling. And I, I was at this opening and this beautiful woman rolls in in a wheelchair. And this was in the late 1990s. So I've been working on the series for 20 years now, 22 years. And she had on a, a, a dress with a low back on it. And you could see this big scar on her back. And this was before the Iraq war, and it was sort of unusual to see people sort of saying, yeah, I've got this big scar, deal with it. You know, people, especially in Beverly Hills, people were still trying to cover up, you know, anything that was an imperfection. So any, I, I was completely drawn to her, and I, I, depending on the age of the people watching, I will tell this part of the story, I was because it's Beverly Hills, I was talking to Henry Winkler and Candace Bergen, and this woman rolls in the gallery, and I just was transfixed by her, and I just walked right in between the two of them. I don't know what they were saying to me. I just, like, stopped in the middle, walked over to this woman in the wheelchair, and we started talking about how our illnesses had affected our art. She had been a dancer, and now she was working with a, a dance company, adding like wheelchair movements to her choreography. And I told her that I used to do work about being sick. And she's like, she really got on my case. She's like, that is still part of you. And she started calling me a, a tab, a temporarily able-bodied person. She kept saying, you know, all you able-bodied people, you think this is not going to be the same for you when you're older, but it is, and you, this is still part of you. So those two women, the one that said, it's okay to emote, and the other one that said, you shouldn't stop emoting, um, changed my life. The two of them are responsible for my art. So that the next day, I called her up, and uh, I asked her if I could come make a monoprint of her scar, so which involved rolling ink on her back, pressing paper against it, and pulling a print. Um, so luckily she said yes, and I, I made this print and I showed it along with two others at a gallery. And people kept walking up to me and they were like, let me show you my scar, let me show you where I, uh, you know, they were pulling up dresses and they were pulling down shirts and unbuttoning things to show me their scars. And they were all volunteering. Like, I want you to make a print of my scar. I want to tell my story of what happened. So what, and, and again, you know this more than almost anybody I know. But, you know, there's a point where the doctors say, okay, your body is healed, but you are not mentally healed from what happened to you. And what I found is that doing prints of people's scars, it sort of gave them a finality where they could go, look what, I, look what happened to me. There's a print of it, I can stick it on the wall, you know, because there's all of us that have been through something know that there's, 
There's the day your bones are back together, but it might still be two or three years until your body is totally recuperated, until you're especially like what happened to me was not sudden like you that needed we you and I have a completely different system probably of how we've processed our lives because yours was so instantaneously different whereas mine is a long slow drip 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 you know but everybody processes what happened to them and and a lot of times there's you know like you know the day you were in the, the car accident but there's no actual day when you're better there's not a you know healing can take so long and it's such a long process so so doing these prints it's sort of like a celebration like look what you went through you survived it you are a survivor and now we're gonna make a concrete image of it for you to look at and do what you want with so that's that's a long long explanation but that's how i went from the little kid in the hospital to doing work about other people it's a beautiful story and it makes me think of what you're offering people is redemption to a certain extent, right? It's redemption for the negative experiences that one has been through to be able to now own that experience, share that experience, and then see a thing of beauty come from that experience. And that... I believe is a redemption. Um, I'm very struck by that idea. I don't know if it's, well, I'm not a religious person, so I may be just the word redemption, mm -hmm. but it's definitely an acknowledgement that they have suffered and they've survived it. And in most cases, I, you know, I think all of us that make it through these things are a little stronger. So I think the survival the survival aspect of it you know if you have a scar and you can point to it you're above ground and you made it through mm -hmm. so i think that's important to a lot of people you know because there's so many times people don't they want to be supportive of their friends but it's most people don't really want to go into the minutia of what happened to other people and so a lot of people suffer in silence, even if they're surrounded by people. And I think saying to them, look, I've made something beautiful out of what happened to you and you can let go of it now. Um, I think it's really important. So I'm going to keep doing these things. I mean, I've got a hundred of them more. And I'm, anytime someone writes me or calls me and says, I want to do one, I, I'd love to have a print. I'm teaching art therapists now how to do them for their patients so they can have the same experience of helping their their clients uh, let go of things. So it's sort of- Well, that, that idea of, yeah, that idea of letting it go. Um, hmm. Yeah, oh, it, it, I, I guess I wanna go back to a question that I was thinking of a few moments ago, which was, you've been through a lot of surgeries, as have I. Do you have a favorite scar? <laughs> well, you know, it's <laughs> it's funny because I, I have I had my spleen out, I've had both hips replaced a couple times, I've had shoulders fixed. Um, the one that I have the best story for is I, I broke my wrist and my bones are kind of fragile. So if I fall, they'll, they'll break. And uh, I, I was at my house one day and, and my girlfriend had come over with her kids. And I used to live in this big artist colony and they didn't have a washer dryer there. So she took all the towels home with her. And uh, I got out of the shower, there was no towels and I, I, I went over to the closet to get them and there were two sets of towels. There were towels, uh, plain ones, and there were the ones that my late mother had used that had her monogram on them that I had never used my entire life. My mom had just died and I had them in the house and I was looking at the towels going, plain or the monogrammed ones? And I thought, oh, I can finally use these monogram towels. And I reached up to get them, and at some point, I fainted. I, I fell on the ground on my hand and broke my wrist. It just twisted around. 
And I didn't think anything of it, but my cousin said to me, that was your mom looking down on you going, those towels are for the guests. Those are not for you. <laughs> so, so that's the one I like the best. Well, <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story, um, and, and I, with with the, the the medical things that you've been through, uh, one of the questions that I always ask uh, guests is: Is there a time when uh, that you can think of that that a person was there for you, or that you were there for another person? It's that whole idea of being with or being present. Um, whether it was in one of these medical journeys that you've described or another aspect of life, is there a, is there a time that comes to mind when I ask that question about being there for someone else or someone being there for you? Yeah. So it's, it's interesting. I've been writing these a whole bunch of short stories about not me being sick, but things I saw around me happening because I was sick. And of course my mom pops up a lot on these and we had, sort of a fraught relationship um, for a number of reasons. One of which is she, she became so identified as a caregiver for myself and my late brother, who also had the same illness, that she was sort of overly protective of us. So as a kid, you know, there was a lot of, because I, a lot of tension, because even if I was sick, I wanted to go do everything everybody else did. But as I've been writing these stories, it really comes around how much of a caregiver she was, you know, and I'm sort of 20 years after her death, reevaluating our relationship of what she went through, what she gave up, the financial burden on the family of having two sick kids. Um, so I, I mean, there's lots of people like the ones that helped me with the art and things like that, but you know, it goes back to mom, I think she, mm -hmm. because I had this really weird disease at a time before there was an internet and she had to find out what it was. She had to find a doctor. She had to find, you know, other people whose kids had the same disease. There weren't a lot of adults with it then because they would have died. Um, she did an amazing job. So, you know, as an adult now, I can sort of look back and give her a lot more leeway than I gave her when I was younger. You know, I, I when I talk about the idea of I'm here, it's I think most people can relate to that because even as a young child, we know that we're reaching out for a parent uh, to be present and kind of look over us and take care of us and just be there. And so it makes all the sense in the world why many of us, our, our parent would be the first one. And it's only with years of maturity and meeting people that you, um, that you realize, wow, not everybody had, uh, that, that type of mother, right? Yeah. And maybe it's less common as opposed to, uh, than, than, than we'd like to imagine, but it's, I'm, I'm glad you had a good mom that was, that was good at taking care of you and your brother and, uh, there for you during that's, those are pretty scary times for a parent too. I'm, yeah, I have to imagine. And I never saw that side of it. You know, I never saw that she, until I started writing these stories, the fact of how much of a caregiver she was didn't. To me, she was just my mom that was telling me not to do things because I might get hurt, you know. So, so writing these, you know, writing down ideas and history really sort of made me start seeing things from her side. And speaking of seeing things, this is, I've had a few other artists on the show before. Um, a couple that are close friends and different types of artists. And I, I, I feel like for visual artists like yourself and uh, phot photographic artists, I, I miss out on a lot of really great stuff just, you know, by the virtue of blindness. Um, and, and you've, you've kind of given us an overview of, of, what goes into some of your exhibits and projects. 
Can you describe one or two of the of the visual images that uh, museum goers or exhibit goers might see when they're looking at your project of people with bodies that have been uh, shaped differently by trauma or illness? Okay. Well, do you have a uh, do you have a couple of pieces that are well, just the, like the first, wow? My, that is my, my favorite. favorite. Is is actually the first one I did of that woman in the wheelchair mm -hmm. with the big scar. Um, it's it's a beautiful picture of her from the back with a big blue stripe. Okay, so what I do is I roll ink on the people. I do my print, and then I photograph them with the ink on their back or the ink over the scar, because. I want people to know where on the body the scar is, but I'm not really wanting them focused on how mangled the body might be. Um, and the ink sort of covers up a lot of the imperfections. It's, it's more of a geographic marker. So in her case, it's, she's sitting in the wheelchair. It's from the back. There's this big blue stripe. She's beautiful face and very strong shoulders from using the wheelchair. Um, I, I love this, this picture. It's, um, I think it's sexy. I think it shows how strong she is. Um, and, and again, this project, it's, even though it's about what happened to people, it's about how they survived and where they're going. And I think that's a perfect picture. And I have a couple veterans that are just amazing pictures who have had amputations or muscles blown off their bones. And um, yeah, they're, they're kind of amazing. They're kind of amazing. And now I'm working at Keck and what I do there is I show other people's artists. So that's the next thing. I went from me to people that I con came in contact with where I told their stories and now I curate shows by other artists who have illnesses that are doing work about it. Because I can't tell every story. So I have these artists come in and I tie them to the curriculum of the medical school at USC. So if we're studying respiratory illness, I might bring in an artist who's had cystic fibrosis and a lung transplant or emphysema if they do work about that illness or neurological condition. Maybe someone's got Parkinson's or MS and they do work about it. So, um, and you're actually having this time with the students and sharing this, or this is like an yeah. exhibit that's set so up. USC has been great. They gave me uh, a gallery in the medical school building. I have a basement, it had beautiful lighting. It used to be a gallery, this has always been my joke, it used to be a gallery where the faculty would show their pictures of monkeys they took in Costa Rica, and then I, they brought me in and I'm like, okay, we have to get rid of the monkeys, we want this gallery to be part of the curriculum now. You know, we want it to be a learning space. So I started showing these artists whose work corresponded to the body systems being studied and the med school works in blocks. So they'll have a neuro neurology block, a respiratory re reproduction blocks. And I give each of these artists a show. And the whole idea is that I want the doctors to look at these people's work and think, well, there's more to these people than hormone levels and bacteria levels. I want them to, I want them to see that people like you and me, who have been through a lot of crap, not only can we make the best of it, we often do, and, and a lot of people make really amazing art. So, so the art that I show, like if, if someone has cystic fibrosis, I want them to show the work about cystic fibrosis. I don't want, uh, a, not that I'm mocking the photos of your dogs behind you, but I, I don't want them showing their dog, you know? Right, right, yeah. Um, although I have shown someone who did some drawings of her, the dog, her helper dog, mm -hmm. um, because that's part of her existence. But I, I want the, 
the doctors to look and think, all these people that have illnesses have full lives, they have things going on outside the exam room, outside of their operations, and these things lead to creativity. And they, you know, if you're a writer and you read Kerouac or you read, you know, Steinbeck, you go, oh, here's people with miserable lives and, we, and they've written amazing books about people having terrible things happen to them. And everybody thinks it's amazing art. But if it's someone like you or me and we do art about a heart transplant or a colon reproduction, reconstruction or your car accident, it's almost like people are like, why do I want to see that? <laughs> well, I think people should see it because it tells a story. It tells our story. And I want these doctors to realize that all of us that they are going to be treating for the next 20 to 30 years, we have stories and we are fuller humans because of these stories. So I try really hard to get as many artists in to tell their stories and, you know, so the doctors don't treat us like, you know, just a, b a bunch of hormone levels. Just a diagnosis, right, yeah. right. That's the word I, I I'm very for. fond of saying, yeah, not a diagnosis, not a not a, a room number or, you know, not a surgical procedure, but an, an actual fully authentic formed human being. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad that you're you're doing this work to to showcase human beings uh, to to docs. That's that's really great stuff. And if I can help you uh, in any way, find artists for that are doing this kind of work. Um, Maybe yeah, we they should can talk always... offline and, and yeah, I'd yeah, love to be able to. People can always find me online way. and uh, send me, send me images. So, and I'm, I'm starting to work with the University of Indiana. I do some work with uh, Western University. So I'm, I'm trying to expand this to more and more medical campuses. So hopefully that will continue. Wonderful. Wonderful. Yeah. Yeah. I'd like to, I'd like to help you expand that if I can too. That's, that's great work. Ted, I got, I got a few minutes left. So can I, can I shoot some kind of random questions by you? Sure. And I have one for you too at the end. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you know, I asked you about your, your favorite scar and, um, and if I, <laughs> the reason I asked that question is because it was, it was, posed to me decades ago uh and not anything specific to me uh it, it wasn't really it was in a kind of a group setting where we were all discussing some type of uh you know just get to know you sort of things and at the time uh it has since changed due to more surgery but at the time i had a single scar here under my um, left breast, and it was just a perfect smiley face. Oh. <laughs> and and I always uh, and I always thought about, uh, <laughs> hey, that'd be great. Then I'll tattoo a couple of eyes up here. <laughs> I'll have a nipple for a nose, and I've got a happy face on my chest. Uh, so it it with what we're talking about today, it makes me want to ask the question, um, do you have tattoos? And if so, do you have a favorite one or one that tells a great story? You know what? I do not, but I have a, st mm. I have a story. There was a point, sure. uh, I was going to go get one and I had decided I was going to get these little bands on my arm and they would start at my wrist and they would get bigger as they went up my arm. And I would start with, red, green, blue, black, or the, the process colors, because I was doing graphics at the time, and I'm a painter, so I thought I'm going to have the colors, and then they're going to go up my arm. And about two days before I was going to get it done is when I broke my wrist. And the tattoo guy said, we can't do anything for a year or two over a scar like that. So by then, I dropped the idea. So, so no, I don't. <laughs> No, okay. Well, I, I, if you were ever to think about getting one, I, I tell you, it was 
horrible. <laughs> it was so painful. And I guess, I think part of this is, is probably trauma, but I can't deal with pain. And laying there, even though he was, whenever I finally got one later that had nothing to do with what we were talking about, uh, even on my chest, I sat there the whole time, just tears running down my face. So uh, if you're sensitive to pain, <laughs> I can't uh, I can't necessarily recommend you go through with it. Yeah, no, I, I think I, I think the moment's passed for me on that. The moment is passed. All right. Um, do you have a favorite book or a book that that uh, helped maybe steer your life? Well, my favorite book is Confederacy of Dunces, which I just always loved. Um, but no, I just, you know, it's funny. I'm not a huge reader. I think part of that. So one of the things from all this is I'm sort of dyslexic. And since I didn't go to school as a kid, nobody caught it until I was much older. So I tend to read lots of magazines. I, I you know, I do read books, but I don't read I don't read tons of them. I, I like Brave New World. I like, you know, a lot of science fiction. But I just, uh, I didn't even catch that I was dyslexic till I was older because my bad reading, they always went, well, you missed a lot of school. That was the excuse for everything. You missed a lot of school. And then it wasn't until the, the person I've been dating now for like, my girlfriend for like 14 years, every once in a while I would read a sign to her and she'd go that's not what that sign says and then i'd look at it and the letters would be in a completely different order and i'd go you're right it's it's <laughs> says something completely different so i am not a huge reader for long things lots of short things lots of like dave sedaris sort of short stories um i buy lots of books like that but not I have a real hard time with with long novels and things like that. As Everything that you've named there, I'm also a fan of. So <laughs> I imagine we have uh, quite a bit of, of literary crossover interest. There was a point, this was probably about 10 years ago, where I was thinking about all the books that, because I missed so much school, I hadn't read, like Grapes of Wrath, Uncle Tom's Cabin, all these things. And I went back and I read all of them all. Mm -hmm. And I, that was a fun year, but it, you know, it's hard for me. So, yeah. Well, and last question then that I have for you, and this is might be kind of difficult, but um, the question that I pose to you and I pose to all of my guests is that if you had the world's largest billboard on the world's tallest mountain, what is the message that you would want to broadcast to humanity? Oh, gosh. Stop being stupid. Think long term. I, I'm, I'm amazed by the short sightedness of, of humanity. I mean, we're, we're facing this immense ecological disaster coming up. And people are upset about what bathroom people go in, you know, and yeah, I none of that matter. I mean, I understand that it's a, a moral thing for certain people. They're against. I mean, I'm not, but they don't like trans. They don't like this. They none of it's going to matter if the earth heats up and we're all dead in 20 years. I mean, it's it's the only thing. And. We just don't think long term. The UN climate report came out, you know, a week ago saying we have two to three years till we hit that 1.5 temperature where it's a lot of irreversible stuff. And I haven't noticed anybody changing anything. <laughs> uh, right, right. There was something about the Colorado River today, but <laughs> there's... There's no water. Uh, are, are, are we already... Right. I was going to say, are are we already headed for the precipice and it's a speeding train? But I don't want to be too negative about that. But gosh, it does seem like we we as a global society lack the will to uh, prevent our own demise. Yeah. 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 Oh, oh. Well, Ted, thank you so much for, for being with me today. And you said you had a question for me. I before have a question we go, for right? you. Well, yeah, hit me. On our first interview... You mentioned a time 
where you almost thought, I'm going to let myself die. I'm tired of this. And then you sort of, as you were hitting that point of maybe no return, either realist really or just in your head, you went, no, I want to live. I had that exact, I was listening to you tell that story and I had that exact same thing. I was 12 years old. I was in the hospital. I'd been in the hospital for a long time and I was not getting better. And I just thought I'm, I'm ready to die. And I was like, well, I can't OD. I can't do, you know, I couldn't get out of bed even, but I had the exact same thing of like, okay, feeling like I was going to die and having that moment of, no, maybe I don't really want to die. When it would, given that, because I really felt like I, that moment, just like you described it, like I could make that decision. And then I woke up, I fell back asleep. I woke up the next morning, I was all better. And I'm, I'm atheist, so I think there's just something about it. I kicked my body into gear. Um, you know, but it was, it was amazing hearing you tell almost word for word the same story where you, you were so sick of it that you wanted out and then realized, no, I don't really want out. <laughs> there's that moment of, I guess, a point of no return <laughs> that, yeah. that uh, I felt like I may have had one foot into that already. And that's like, nope, dipping a toe in was enough. And, um, it, it did that, that changed. And I'm, I'm really glad to hear that, 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 uh, sparked something in you or, or caused a memory there too. It's, it, it's a profound experience. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And, and I remember the people around me the next morning going like, he's all better. What, what happened? Mm -hmm. You know, they were really surprised. And and as I got older, there, and I would notice the patterns of when I would get sick a lot and land up in the hospital, a lot of times they were something emotional that happened and I, I probably let my immune system down. And there was a certain point where I, I was about 24 and I was just like, I'm not getting sick anymore. And whenever I would get depressed or things would go wrong, like I got fired from a job, I thought, I am not gonna let my body collapse this time and send me to the hospital. And since then, I haven't had, I've had some pains, but I haven't had to go to the hospital, you know? Wow. And it, it just sort of brings up how, uh, it makes me always wonder how much, not for something like yours, which is an external, but for people like me, how much is internal? How much do we drive our own narrative medically, you know? Wow. Gosh, we could, we could talk for an hour on that subject, right? Next time. Yeah, next time. Well, Ted, thank you so much for, for being with me today. Um, I really appreciate your time, and I'm glad you're here doing the work that you're doing. It's, uh, it's impressive. It's beautiful stuff, and uh, I'm glad I got to share you with the audience today. Oh, well, same to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And, and listeners, thank you for being part of this episode of Compassion and Courage, Conversations in Healthcare. I'm Marcus Engel. I'm your host. And this is the podcast that teaches compassionate communication, provides perspective, and inspires resilience. I want to remind you that if you are looking for leadership development talks or staff retention and recruiting and engagement and satisfaction, all of those types of things, all that information can be found at MarcusEngel.com. Please visit MarcusEngel.com, and I'd love to hear how I can help make your next event a huge success. Thank you all so much for being here today, and we will see you on the next episode of Compassion and Courage.